right, good evening, good to see each and every one of you. Stand with me if you will. We're going to sing Send the Light, page number 307. We'll do all four verses. Welcome to our missions conference revival. Our theme is Send the Light, so what a perfect song to sing with that, right? All four verses, page 307. <clears throat> There's a call come ringing o'er the restless wave. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine. Macedonia called today, send the light, send the light, and the golden offering at the cross we lay, send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Right, hold on just a second. I know you think I'm crazy, which is probably right, but I think we've been singing forevermore on that last part of that verse as long as I can remember. So even though the words might say it, I'm probably going to sing forevermore, so you can, check, you can pick whichever way you want to do it. be all right, okay? Verse number three. Let us pray that grace may everywhere abound. Send the light, send the light. And the Christ-like spirit everywhere be found. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light. Send the light, let us gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. Back to page 296. We have a story to tell the nations. We'll do all four verses. Page 296. We have a story to tell to the nations that shall turn their hearts to the right. A story of truth and mercy. A story of peace and light. A story of peace and light. For the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning a new day bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. We have a song to be sung to the nations that shall lift their hearts to the Lord. A song that shall conquer evil and shatter the spear and sword. And shatter the spear and sword. For the darkness shall turn to dawning and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light a message to give to the nations that the Lord who reigneth above has sent us his son to save us and show us that God is love and show us that God is love for the darkness shall turn to dawning and the dawning to noonday bright and Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. We have a Savior to show to the nations through the path of sorrow and trod that all of the world's great people might 
come to the truth of God. I come to the truth of God. For the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. Brother Larry, sure good to see you this evening. Would you open us up in a word of prayer? Amen. All right. You can be seated tonight. We do greet you and welcome you to our uh, first service of our 53rd Annual World Missions Conference. And uh, as Brother Ken said, our theme is Send the Light. We've got some brochures. You need to grab one of these if you haven't already gotten one. And uh, you'll find uh, our theme on there, a schedule on the back, and then on the inside you'll find uh, a picture and a write-up on our two uh, main speakers this week, Brother Ken Trivet, who I'll say more about momentarily, and then coming in Friday and Sunday, our Pastor Emeritus, Brother Mark Thrift. Um, and then there's also a list of, I think, all of the missionaries and church planners we support. We might have missed a few, but uh, nonetheless, the majority of them. And then a picture of all of our special guests, uh, minus David Cook. Brother David, as you know, could not make it. Miss Kathy has surgery tomorrow. And, uh, and so be, be in prayer for them. Of course, David, if you don't know, is a missionary out of our church. Uh, he was a church planner in Canada for, uh, for many years. He was in Germany and England prior to that, in Mexico prior to that. And, and, uh, but for the majority of his ministry, 30-plus years in, in Canada, Brother David couldn't make it. Miss Kathy has surgery tomorrow. And so you pray for, uh, pray for her. They want to be here. I spoke to him earlier today. Uh, but nonetheless, get one of these and, and uh, take that with you. And certainly give you a good prayer list for missions in there as well. Um, let me thank our missions, uh, our, our missions team, our, that has worked really hard getting, getting uh, our missions band. I lost the word band for a second. You worked really hard getting everything ready for our conference. I appreciate that very, very much. From the decorations you see done to a lot of things behind the scenes as well, uh, getting gift baskets together for our guest in their hotel room, and then just a lot, a lot of other things, too. So thank you, Missions Band. You've worked hard. I, I am grateful, and you've, you've done well. Served our Lord and our church very well, and I appreciate that very, very much. All right. Um, as far as announcements, we will we will do this again tomorrow night at 7, Friday night at 7, nothing on Saturday, and then Sunday we will have Sunday school at, at uh, 10 o'clock, worship at 11. We will conclude worship by... Uh, taking up a faith promise offering for missions. We'll reveal that amount, and then we'll be dismissed. We'll be done for the day. No evening services on Sunday. That's two weeks in a row. That was not planned. Uh, I don't necessarily like that, but it's just kind of how it fell. And so, but nonetheless, we'll be, we'll be back on Sunday night a week from this coming Sunday. We've got a busy week ahead of us, but it's going to be a blessed week. We're looking forward to it. Um, let me just introduce our guest while, we're, while I've got the mic in my hand. You'll hear more from Brother Daniel Jones and, and uh, about Operation Renewed Hope here momentarily. Brother Daniel's going to present. Good to have you and your family here tonight, brother. And, of course, Ken Trivett's no stranger. He has preached every missions conference that we've had since 2017. And, um, and then we've even made a, a few of us uh, made a trip to visit him in South Dakota. And uh, just uh, there's been, and I, I say this, honestly, there's been no one since since I became pastor of this church, that has been a bigger mentor to me, influence than, than Brother Ken. There are some, like Brother Mark, that are on that level, but Brother Ken's been a great friend to me. I appreciate you. love you very much, Brother. One of my closest friends, Brother Jeff Taylor, is here, and uh, he'll represent Come Before Winter here later this week. He's also going to teach for us on Sunday morning during Sunday school in the adult class. Jeff's filled the pulpit here a few times as well. He's been here probably more than any of our other guests, and if he keeps, keeps coming, then... Um, 
then we may just not let him go back. We may put him on staff at the church as associate pastor or something. And if any of you know any good fishing holes, you let him know, and you'll you know, soon as say we'll be well on our way to getting getting Jeff here full time. And uh, and then Brother Timothy Jansen as well. Brother Timothy sitting here, he's a pastor in uh, Victoria, British Columbia. Now, I got to visit with him for a week last year in June. Me and Brother David Cook, and uh, looking forward to hearing more about that ministry, Capital City Baptist Church in Victoria. Amen. Good to have you tonight, brother. All right. Brother Ken, let's sing some more. All right, stand with me again. Page 299, Rescue the Perishing. We're going to do all four verses of page 299. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We for the erring one lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Though they are sliding him, still he is waiting, waiting the penance a child to receive. Plead with him earnestly, plead with him gently. He will forgive if they only believe. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feeling like fairy that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness, chords that are broken will vibrate once more. A rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Drink for thy labor, the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer a Savior is died. A rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Take up a love offering tonight. And uh, so if you've been asked to be an usher, why don't you come at this time? All right. Lee, right in the middle. Okay. All right. All right. Everything we take up, of course, throughout this week will go to our invited guests. Uh, expenses of this meeting will come out of our budget. This will go directly to them. And so you give as God lays that on your heart. We always want to be a blessing to our guests and take good care of them. When they leave here, we want them to feel feel very loved and appreciated by our church. And so uh, you you give this week and, and uh, trust the Lord in that area. Uh, Lee, you pray for us. Okay, buddy? All right.
The day a man is somewhere Proclaiming the good news Winning families to Jesus All around his neighborhood He tells them that God is able To make their house a home He wants to win his world for Christ But he can't do it alone But each one can reach one As we follow after Christ We all can lead one We can lead one To the Savior Then together we can tell the world That Jesus is the way If we each one message is unchanging go ye into all the world and share the love of Jesus or away and door to door you see just like somebody told you that Jesus loves you so you must tell someone who will tell someone until the whole world knows but each one can reach one As we follow after Christ We all can lead one We can lead one to the Savior Then together we can tell the world That Jesus is the way if we each one reach one so will you go and labor will you hold high your life one by one and two by two we can win our world for jesus christ each one and reach one as we follow after Christ we all can lead one we can all lead one to the Savior then together we can tell the world that Jesus is the way if we each one reach one if we all would reach just one advisor would say on a regular basis to us that disciples disciple disciples disciple of course part of discipleship is the great commission and uh, so thank you brother Ken that was, that was excellent amen well again we're thrilled to have brother Daniel Jones uh, his family here tonight brother you come on up here I'll let you introduce your family to us and we do have a bit of a history with not necessarily brother Daniel but operation renewed hope when hurricane Harvey flooded our uh, city, uh, we, if you recall, we were able to partner with with Operation Renewed Hope, Brother Will Cover, Rise Baptist Church, and our church, and uh, the organization he represents sent us four tractor trailer loads full of supplies and goods, and and uh, and so that's that's Operation Renewed Hope. He'll say more about that. He's got a video, and, uh, and so brother, here you go. Thank you, brother. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. 
Thank you so much. It's good to, good to be with you all here. Thank you for the, uh, inviting us to your mission conference, and thank you for the hospitality. Uh, we thank you all uh, for the gift baskets. My, my children were so excited. thought Christmas came again early, and uh, that was a real blessing, and we just appreciate uh, just appreciate the service so far. You have beautiful facilities here. Appreciate the song, Brother Ken, the music, and uh, just been <coughs> a wonderful time at lunch today with your pastor and Brother Trivet, and uh, it's a small world. He's, he's His brother-in-law was one of my early mentors in my Christian walk, and uh, just it's amazing how the Lord leads us. But um, but my name's Daniel Jones, and I'm glad to have my, my wife with me, Jessica Jones, and I've got four kids, Anna, Laura, Caleb, and Titus, and um, Titus is asleep, and that usually happens when I start talking, so that's okay. But, um, but we, uh, my background's medical. Uh, I'm trained as a PA, worked in uh, family practice internal medicine for many years, and, um, but <clears throat> my wife, she's an RN. Uh, but, you know, uh, the Lord gripped my heart with this truth many years ago that um, I, enjoy, I enjoy medicine, enjoy helping people with medicine, but medicine will help people for a short while, but the only thing that helps for eternity is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we began to pray. Lord, how can you use us in, in what we do to help further your kingdom? And so the Lord opened the door years ago in 2011 with a ministry called Operation Renewed Hope. And it does a lot of things around the world. It's uh, been in existence for about 30 years. And we do a lot of disaster relief as we work here with Hurricane Harvey. Uh, but I guess a little, a little of the flagship of the ministry is medical, medical missions. We take medical teams um, all around the world and preach the gospel, use that as a platform for the gospel. And uh, we also uh, do, do some other things. But um, so I began traveling with them, and the Lord really just did a work in my heart and uh, began going several times by vocational and ended up, ended up being a pastor for about four years. And then uh, the founder of Operation Red Hope, he asked me to, to uh, consider taking his role as a director. So the Lord led us into that position a couple of years ago. So we're full time now with Operation Renewed Hope. And uh, we take our scripture from the ninth chapter of Matthew. In Matthew 9, 35 and 36, but Jesus went about all the, the, the villages and synagogues, preaching, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every manner of sickness and disease among the people. Uh, <clears throat> when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And everywhere we go, we see the multitudes and they, they're fainted. That means they just, they're just overwhelmed with life, ready to throw in the towel because they have no hope and they don't have a good shepherd. I'm so glad I can say the Lord is my shepherd. We want to we want to introduce him to the good shepherd and our our motto is you touch a man's heart you can reach a man's soul and so we take teams we take teams of whoever will go they're all volunteers um, I just got back from Ghana with a team of 37 we went to Winchy it's in West Africa and we went to Bronham Bronham has no church uh, Wincy has a small work and we were able to see 1360 patients and um, we did medical we did dental did optometry uh, give glasses attend dental work took about, we had about five or six doctors with us and nurse practitioners, PAs, lots of nurses. Half the team's non-medical uh, from churches. You say, where do they come from? Well, churches just like this one, all over, the, all over the U.S. and even in other countries. We had somebody from Germany, a couple people from India that went with us on that team. And, um, and we follow a model. If you, look, if you look at missions, I really think you study out missions, Acts, Acts 13, the Church of Antioch. We consider that cradle of missions, right? And they, they sent out the first two missionaries, Paul and Barnabas, and they sent them out of the Church of Antioch, and they went out that first missionary journey, read about it, Acts 13 and 14, and then they come back, and I love how they come back in, in chapter 14, they, they rehearsed all that God had done with them. And that's, that's just the greatest thing we never say. God does something with our life. You know, we don't deserve it, but, but in, that, in that 14 chapter, in verse 21, uh, the Bible says, I think there's a this missions in a nutshell. Number one, it says they preach the gospel. And, um, you know, we're not trying to do anything different. I believe the gospel is the most important message the world needs to hear. And if you go and preach the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's something special about that message. I don't care where you are. I don't care what, what, what nationality, what religious presupposition you're dealing with. I don't care, you know, what dialect you're speaking, what race, or whatever. Uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said this way. He said, I'm not, not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God and salvation. Everyone believes the Jew first and the Greek. You preach the gospel, and that will get the work done. And so we preach the gospel to everybody that comes through the clinic. And when they come through, we take care of them, and we try to give them compassion. And you, 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 you warm, warm them up with compassion, show, love them, and they'll listen to what you have to say. And we just preach the gospel, just a simple gospel message, 10, 15 minutes. And the second part of that is 
The next verse says they, they confirm the souls of the disciples. And what does that mean? That means confirming the souls of the disciples, discipleship. So that's important. That's just an important part of the Great Commission is, is preaching the gospel. And so Operation Renewed Hope, we never go anywhere in the world where there's not a good, solid pastor, uh, missionary, somebody that's going to be there long term that's going to follow up on people to get saved and disciple them. Who's going to train them up? Who's going to teach them? To train them up in the right doctrine and help them grow in grace and knowledge. So that's discipleship. And this, the next verse says, and they ordained elders in every church and every city. And so elders are another, another name for pastor. And so Operation Renewed Hope, we are a ministry local church. I'm a, I'm a local church guy. I don't want to do anything that's not a part of the local church. Everything that we do, we want to either try to help establish a new church, plant a new church, or we want to help you know, help strengthen the church. So everything's tied into local church. Same with disaster relief. Uh, we, we do a lot of disaster relief all over the world. We do that through a local church. Use that church just as we did this one in Hurricane Harvey as to help the church, number one, but also use that as a, a platform for the gospel, for the community. As Galatians says, as, as we therefore have opportunity, let's do good to all men, especially as a household of faith. So we're working all over the world right now and um, working in Israel, working in Ukraine. I was in Ukraine last September. Um, a lot of people getting saved in Ukraine right now. It's a horrible thing going on there. People are very open to the gospel. And uh, I, we were working in uh, Haiti. We just sent a, sent a load of food down to Haiti to Jock Mail on a ship. And uh, it's a rough situation down there. But, um, and so we're, we're in contact with some people in Taiwan that got hit with that uh, earthquake yesterday. Um, so those are, those are some of the things we do. Um, I want to take you on a trip, show you a video. Uh, one of our team members made this video uh, several years ago, and I think it really gives you a good kind of a feel of what it's like to go with Operation Renewed Hope. Maybe, maybe you like to go. We'd love for you to go. Uh, we'll, we'll, it's very organized. We plan these trips out a couple years in advance. I got a guy right now in Uganda. He's setting up for a trip. We're going in November. We're going to Northwest Uganda to the Ring of People Groups. So red dot on the, if you look at Unreached People Groups uh, .net, Joshua Project .net. So it's a red dot on the map. It's Unreached People Group. We're going to take a medical clinic. He said, I think a medical clinic would be good to to warm up and, and, and make some inroads to these people. Hey, I'm your guy. We'll take a team. Let's go. And so we're excited about that. But I'm going to take you on a trip to Peru, and uh, you can kind of see what it's like to go with Operation Hope. So, uh, Brother Ben, can you run, roll that? Imagine if you could see people as God sees them and show to them the love of Christ. Through the ministries of Operation Renewed Hope, we were blessed with such an opportunity in Peru. The people of Peru need the gospel, and through medical clinics, we were able to bring the gospel and assist local missionaries. ORH takes its model from the ninth chapter of Matthew. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. The team of medical and non-medical personnel arrived in Puerto Maldonado. We were joined with more than 20 local church members who helped with logistics and translation. Situated near the Bolivian border, Puerto Maldonado is in the Amazon rainforest along the river Madre de Dios. Our first clinic day was held in the migrant village of Toledo, which was carved out of the jungle by the poor from the Andes mountain region seeking work. God is working among these people. Local missionaries, Buddy and Lauren Fitzgerald, have been ministering in the area for more than seven years. Using ORH clinics as a platform, they reached the lost in their city and in the surrounding jungle communities. On day two, we split into two teams. The first team boarded a barge for a short trip across the river. God brought people from far and wide to this clinic. Some traveled more than three hours to have their family receive care. They came for the free medicine, but many left with Christ's free gift of salvation as well. The second team made the drive back to the Toledo area. There. 
they boarded boats for an hour-long trip up the river to the small jungle village of the Amarakaid people. Missionaries Dan and Ruth Nagao, serving with the Fitzgeralds, have been laboring faithfully to shepherd a small church started from a prior ORH trip to Peru. These villagers are less than a generation removed from being warriors traipsing through the jungle, killing and terrorizing surrounding tribes. We had a, a group of youth come visit. I asked the local community here, we share with them um, why do they need to consider missions? And, and the, the leader stood up and said, let me tell you what happened. Our, our tribe was, was killing men, taking their women, and stealing their goods. And now we know Jesus. This is Carlos, a revered elder in the village and Manuel's brother. Presumably, Manuel has had many chances to witness to his brother. However, it was the work of Operation Renewed Hope volunteers that moved Carlos to listen to the gospel one more time. Watch as the gospel is translated from English to Spanish and Manuel witnesses to his brother in Ulama. Christ tells us we must repent and believe. La Biblia nos dice que nos debemos arrepentir y creer. Repentir y creer. On day three, the team came back together for a clinic in La Jolla, a village that did not exist the year before. La Jolla has no school and just a few tiny shops. The villagers had just recently completed the community center. This building consisted of nothing more than a concrete slab and a roof. But within 30 minutes, it was transformed into a bustling medical clinic. One of the great blessings of the trip was being able to see La Jolla's first church started. This trip was also about training and equipment. The entire 2017 nursing class from Maranatha Baptist University attended. We were also joined with a number of teens from all over Latin America. We pray this trip will instill in them a lifelong love for missions. On the fourth and final clinic day, we returned to La Jolla to find a large crowd waiting patiently for us to arrive. They had begun lining up at 5.30 a.m. The word had definitely spread from those who attended the day before. At times throughout the week, conditions were tough. Lines were long, rain poured, and facilities were primitive. Yet, we as volunteers were surely blessed, blessed by the Peruvian people and especially the children. We were also blessed by Christian fellowship, breaking bread, singing, and playing games together. This wasn't about us, the travelers. It was about God's love for his children and being able to show that love to the people around us. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to see the world through your eyes. And thank you for allowing us to serve. Uh, that's a typical trip. Uh, they're about a week long. Uh, I'm going to Botswana next month to try to get a MOU signed and memorandum of understanding with the Ministry of Health and a missionary Mike Haley we're working with for a trip in 2025. The next month I go to Albania with a team of 56. Uh, we got a trip to Bolivia in July, Guyana in September, um, Uganda in <clears throat> November. We'll go to Cambodia with Dr. Tom Johnson in um, January. Um, so we, we would love for you to sign up and go with us. Um, I got a table back there. You can sign your name and email. Doesn't mean you're committing anything. You're not, you know, committing to go to Yemen or anything like that. You're just getting emails from us. And if the Lord so leads you, you, you want to go. Just you, you let me know, and I can get you information on how you can go go with us. We also have a, a boot camp for teenagers. Uh, that's going to be the first week of June. And uh, we take them out it's to a camp in North Carolina. It's a medical missions boot camp, and they'll... They'll sleep outside all week in a tent and dig their own latrine, and they'll cook on a fire. And it's pretty, we teach them a lot of things that, you know, a lot of people in third world countries live like this every day, and it helps you appreciate. And we teach them a lot of survival skills, things like that, um, first aid CPR, how to work in our clinics. And, and it stretches them a little bit, but teenagers today are they're coddled, 
and they can do a lot more than they think they can. And um, the, the kids that go, it's, it's a little bit of a culture shock first day, um, but they, they do great. And a lot of these kids will go with us. A lot of them are, are going through boot camp. They're going with us to Bolivia or Guyana, and we pray they'll go on into ministry. A lot of them do. They'll go on into ministry, go on into missions, and you see it. You know, Jeremiah says, my heart hath not felt what I hath not seen. And so uh, you pray, pray for us, uh, the Ministry of Operation Renewed Hope, with our medical missions, disaster relief, and we're just thankful uh, to be here and uh, appreciate, again, the hospitality. If you have any questions, um, you, can, you can ask us. We'll be here with you for the next uh, couple of days. And so we're just uh, we're praying for y'all. We're praying for the Missions Conference, Faith Promise. That's something the Lord's blessed in my life. I tell you, even my kids, they even do Faith Promise. And, I, and uh, we don't tell them to. They just, they did. They made a commitment. We don't give them an allowance. But I've heard them. I hear them talking in the van about how, hey, God, God I, I got my Faith Promise for this month. And just, <laughs> you know, the Lord provides. It's just neat to see how... God will he'll bless that in your life. So thank you for the opportunity to present um, the ministry God's called us to. Thank you. That was excellent. That was excellent. I look forward to, to how we can partner with you moving forward. And uh, just just tremendous. I appreciate the priority of the gospel, but the balance as well. Uh, it's just really, really, really good. Amen. Well, Brother Ken, why don't you come at this time? Brother Ken Trivets, no stranger here. I pastored 22 years in Chattanooga, Tennessee at Temple Baptist Church and, and has been on Pine Ridge Indian Reservation for, what, 10 years now? 12 years now, 12 years. And so, Brother Ken, we're glad you're here. Thank you for coming. He'll be preaching tonight and tomorrow. Amen. Ken. Well, it's certainly a joy to be back with you guys. I always enjoy coming to Parkwood. I get to get my suit out of the closet and dust it off and wear it. If I wore a suit, I often say if I wore a suit on the reservation, they'd think I was a federal agent, so... We had a team come in one week, and uh, I tell everybody when they come, just dress down casual. I'd usually just wear a vest or something like that. And, but uh, these were a couple of fellas that you know, they were really spiritual, so they couldn't go to church except they had a suit on. And, uh, but old Stan, I'll never forget, he asked him, he says, are you lawyers? <laughs> So I get to get my suit out. But it is a joy to be back with you. And, and I want to compliment you on your building. What a blessing and beautiful. And I followed your process on Facebook. And uh, it was thrilling when I saw you complete it and your dedication. And so I have looked forward to seeing it uh, myself. And I'm just... I rejoiced for you as I saw the progress and, and saw everything because I knew, know you folks and, and it's just a blessing to see what God has done for you and uh, I rejoice in it and it's a blessing. And I know about building, I went through that and, and I know how building works. I don't care what kind of quote you get, uh, it'll never be the final figure. I don't care what time schedule they give you uh, it will never be finished at that time. And I don't care what they tell you that you have to do. You'll have to do twice as much. There's always something popping up. And then you have the pleasure of dealing with inspectors and all. And that's such a joy, such a joy. And uh, I personally don't believe there'll be a building inspector in heaven. They might be some here tonight, but the ones I dealt with certainly will not. But... Uh, so I know the experience. So I heard Dr. Tom Malone many years ago. <clears throat> he uh, was preaching about Noah, and he's talking about Noah right after the flood, how that he got drunk. And uh, I'll never forget him saying this. And of course, he meant it in humor, but he said, any preacher that had been in a building program for 120 years deserved a drunk. And so, <laughs> so you might give Brother Wesley a break and... Uh, is something happens, but it is a blessing to be here and uh, certainly love your pastor and appreciate him and uh, his leadership. He's a student of the word and that is obvious and, 
And uh, I enjoy the few moments that we have, whether it be by telephone or whatever, and appreciate it. And then good to meet the missionaries tonight, Brother Jones. Uh, we sat down together, and I asked him where he's from. He said it was from Mountain City. And of course, I grew up not too far from Mountain City, and so got to talking. He was actually in my brother-in-law's church there, Brother Gary, and uh, Sister Marisa, my wife's sister, uh, who went home to be with the Lord a couple of years ago during the COVID. And uh, so was, we had some connections we didn't realize. And, uh, and then Brother Jansen got to meet him. And Brother Jeff, always good to see Jeff. I was looking forward to hearing him sing tonight, but Ken, I enjoyed that. That was good. You're singing tomorrow night, aren't you, Jeff? Okay, all right. And uh, we'll all look forward to that, won't we? We might all say amen there. Amen. But it is a joy to be here and to be back with you again. Been a few years with your building and, and COVID and everything. And, uh, but just good to be back. And I know you pray for me. You've been a blessing to us <clears throat> on the reservation in, in, in more than one way. And I want to personally thank you for uh, all the things. The last time I was here, just in a casual comment, uh, I mentioned uh, something about how we're so far away from where we fuel up and everything. But uh, you have hearts here that are sensitive and things. And, and I was not fishing, never even thought about it. But I just made a comment in joke. But somebody here picked that up. And uh, you purchased the uh, tank that we put on our property and that we have the diesel in. And, and that has been such a help. You have no idea. We had, you, the joke I made was we never have a full tank of gas because we'll have to drive so far to fill up. And then by the time we get back, we've done used a quarter tank. And uh, But having the tank there on the property has been a blessing. And, and thank you for doing that and being sensitive to that need. And uh, so... Just things like that make me appreciate you as a people and, and love you for having a heart for the Lord and your history and your love. 53 years, I believe he said, uh, you've been doing this and uh, what a day it's going to be when we get to heaven. And we just never know the lives that are touched through our giving and uh, who we will one day meet in heaven because you enabled somebody to go. I've been on the reservation for 12 years, and I'm so thankful for what the Lord has done there. And for every person that has been saved, you are a part of that. I think of Marla, and I saw Marla. I visit every Saturday I have for all these 12 years. I've maybe missed... Uh, count on one hand the number of Saturdays <clears throat> that I do not visit and go around and see people on Saturday and try to get them in church, go by and let them know what time I'll be picking them up and these kind of things. And, uh, and all of them has been made through casual contacts. I see someone, I saw Marla, I'd stop by uh, at a home there and uh, she was in the little house right beside it. There's a little wall that goes off there. And she was picking up trash in her yard. And I just said, how are you today? And she said, fine. And she thought I was with housing because I was there. And she asked me something about, uh, something there about her house that needed repairing. And I said, I'm not with housing. And uh, she said, well, who are you? And I told her. And uh, I said, I'm going to come down. I said, where you live right there? She said, I do. I said, I'll, I'll, I've got to make a couple of stops here, and I'll swing by and speak to you. And so that's how I met her. And I began going by every Saturday and seeing Marla. And uh, uh, she wouldn't come. You could tell she had no interest in church. She'd never been in church. And, uh, but I kept going by every Saturday and uh, finally, one Saturday, I said to Marla, I said, I'd really like for you to come to church tomorrow. And, uh, and she'd said to me one day, it just means a lot to me that you come by. And that's what I have found in all the cases. That's why I do it every week. And I just go by and knock on the door. How you doing? Have you had a good week? Been praying for you this week. Just want to stop by and check on you and see how you were doing. And she told me one day, she said, it means a lot that you come by. Nobody comes by. 
And, uh, but that day I said, Marla, I, would, I wish you'd come to church tomorrow. And she, and she stood there and looked at me for a minute and she said, well, I don't guess it'll hurt anything. And, uh, and she came and she loved it. And it was about a month later that Marla got saved and uh, it was such a precious thing. She was just weeping that morning. And uh, I think of old Sam. I may have mentioned Sam before. I was visiting one day and I found him in, in, in the weeds. And I, when I first saw him, I thought he was dead. Alcohol is such a problem on the reservation. But I saw him over in the weeds and I went over to him and I thought he was dead, but I realized that he was just passed out, drunk. How long he'd laid there, I, I don't know. It happens all the time. I did a funeral here just uh, about two months ago of a young man, 35 years old, was missing. They finally found him out in the field and uh, he'd went drunk, went to sleep, froze to death that night. And, uh, but I found Sam and it just, it, it, it broke my heart. I, when you live on a reservation and you deal with the poverty that we deal with every day and we see the conditions every day, uh, the hardest thing about living on a reservation is not getting numb to it. When you see it every day and when you deal with it every day, you get used to seeing it. And the hardest thing is not getting numb to it and uh, being broken by the conditions that you see and being moved by the conditions. But uh, that particular day, it just, I can't tell you how, it just, it, it broke my heart when I saw Sam. I didn't know him. And I asked someone, I said, who is that? And they told me. And I said, where does Sam live? And they told me. And I asked the Lord that day, help me to reach Sam. And I started going by Sam's house, and I went by Sam's house every Saturday for three years. Every Saturday, snow, rain, it didn't matter. I went by Sam's house, and finally, one Sunday morning when I pulled up, Sam came out the door, and he came, and Sam started coming, and Sam got saved. And he doesn't miss, he doesn't miss and one of the things about Sam is when he comes out the door, he's always got his Bible under his arms. I don't know what it is about the Indians up there. <clears throat> They'll lose a Bible. They lose, I, we pass out Bibles, new Bibles every week because they lose them. And, uh, but Sam has never lost his, but he'll come out the door with that Bible. And when he talks, you can't hardly understand him. And he's very... Uh, low, most of the Native Americans, when they talk to you, they talk so low that you can't hardly understand them. And, uh, but Sam just kind of grunts. But when he comes out of that door with that Bible under his arm, my heart just leaps every Sunday when I see him. And uh, you're a part of that. And uh, you're through your giving and helping us to be there and enabling us to be there. You are a part of every Indian that is there. We're all, of course, getting old, and over the past year, we've had some health issues, me and my wife both, and so we've had to, to make some changes in how we do things. And I used to run a bus route, a 140-mile round trip every Sunday. I can't do that anymore, so I have divided it. And so I'll pick up Pine Ridge one week. I get the wounded knee area the next week, and I just rotate back and forth. And, uh, but even then, dividing the routes and not getting them all there every Sunday, at least we get them there every other Sunday. And, uh, but the building is still full on Sunday. You, some of you have been there. And it's the most amazing thing uh, to get there, be there on Sunday, and watch them start coming in and filling that building. And even this past Sunday, the Easter's not a big day on the reservation. Not like the South where I grew up in, grew up in the South. Everybody went to church on Easter. Everybody went to church on Mother's Day. And they didn't go the rest of the year, but they was at least there on Easter. But it's, it's not that way so much out West, especially on the reservations. It's more of a family day. But even this past Sunday, so it's all, Easter is usually our, one of our lower days, but the building was full again on Sunday. 
And uh, it's just an amazing thing. And you are part of that through your giving. And so I say thank you. And uh, we just appreciate so much for Wopila is how we would say it on the reservation. Uh, we thank you. Pilamia, I thank you. And so we're grateful for it. And to all that you do, uh, we would say wash day. And that's which is good. Or if it's very good, wash day, yellow. But they have a unique way. Years ago, somebody introduced the Sears Roebuck catalog to them. And so they'd go through the Sears Roebuck catalog and they thought everything come from Chicago. And they'd see that catalog and they thought everything come from Chicago. So if you want to say something is really good, you say, wash day Chicago. So that's the way it is. So to all that you do, wash day Chicago, we thank you. I want you to turn in your Bible to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I've had a thought on my heart for a couple of days that I just can't get away from. And uh, when I first thought about it, I was praying about this night, and this kept just dwelling on me. I thought, this is really not missions. But then the more I studied and and the more I put the thoughts together uh, to share with you tonight, I realized that it is very much connected to missions. Now, you may not think so when I began, but I think before I'm through tonight, you will understand how it is connected to missions, how it is connected to everything that we do and why we do it. But here's this statement. If you would stand as we honor the reading of his word in 1 Thessalonians 5 in verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. May be seated. He speaks about being sanctified and being sanctified holy. Let's pray and I'll share with you. I want to look at this text tonight and share with you a few things that I pray the Lord will use in this missions conference. Our Father tonight in Jesus' name, thank you for letting me be back at Parkwood being with this pastor, being with these dear people. It has been my delight over these years to be a small part of this conference. I am grateful. But I am mindful of the words in Thessalonians where Paul spoke about how he had been allowed of God and had been put in trust. So I come tonight, Lord, realizing that I have a sacred responsibility in these moments. This is something you've allowed me to do, and I am so honored, unworthy, but so honored that you allow me to do what I do. But the trust that you have given me to be faithful to your word, to share you and to speak of you and to lift you up in every moment even in these moments. So I pray now for a few moments that you might bless your word to our understanding and bless your word to our spiritual growth, helping us to understand the purposes of God for our life as a believer. Thank you for this dear pastor, his family again, for this church and all that they do, that the gospel is heard around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Some of you may remember back in the early 80s, there was a little song that came out. I believe the Hempfields did it. It became very popular. Children were singing it everywhere. Even adults were singing it. But a little song that said, He's still working on me. Do you remember that song? He's still working on me. 
to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and stars, the sun and earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be because he's still working on me. When I read this text, I think of that little song because it speaks about how God is working on us. From the moment that I met him 52 years ago yesterday, on an Easter Sunday, April the 2nd, 1972, from the moment that I met him, he's been working on me. He hasn't stopped For 52 years, he's been working on me. He's been working in me that he might work through me. You see, there is the work that God wants to do in our lives. For many people, they are interested in what God wants to do for them. And we're all interested in what God wants to do for us. And that's what many are interested in. God, we want you to do this for me. This is what I want you to do for us. We are interested and our interest seems to be on what God can do for us. And there is a lot that he wants to do, but yet there is much more involved in this matter than what he does for us. There are others, maybe the crowd is smaller, that they're interested in what God does through us. And again, God wants to do something for us. And even more, he wants to do something through us. And again, that's what missions is about, is getting the gospel out, what God does through us. But even lesser the number would be Their interest would be in what God is doing in us. And really that's what the scripture is speaking about. What God is doing in us. And the truth of the matter is, until he does something in us, he's never going to do anything through us. And he'll never do anything for us. So the greatest interest that we ought to have tonight is that he is working on us and that he is working in us. Chapter 4 and verse 3, I read the book today, but he mentions for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. There is God's plan of doing something in us how that he's working in us. Chapter 1 or chapter 2 or chapter 3 rather in verse 13, to the end that he may establish your hearts. There's what God is wanting to do in us. And that's what our text is about tonight. What he wants to do in us so that he can do something through us and do something for us. Look at the text, three simple little thoughts. First of all, I draw your attention to what I want to call a divine objective in the text. There's a divine objective here, and that objective simply is that God can sanctify us wholly. Now, we Baptists, we don't often hear the word sanctify. And sometimes we are a little leery of anybody that uses the word sanctification and maybe because of the connotations that's been attached to it because of those who have distorted what sanctification is all about. But we should not fear the word. We should be very familiar with the word. The word sanctification simply means to set apart or to separate It's a word that you find in the very first chapter of the Bible when God sanctified the first day. He set that part day apart. Six days he worked, and on the seventh day he rested and sanctified or set that part, that day apart as a day of rest. 
Even in the tabernacle, everything about it, it was sanctified. Aaron and his sons were sanctified. That is, they were set apart. They were called out of everyday usage or any other part of their life and set apart for a specific work. Even their garments were said to be sanctified, garments that were not to be used for any other purpose but holy purposes. When you talk about sanctification, you're talking about being set apart or separated from something, being set apart from the old life, being set apart from sin. You are set apart from something, and you are set apart to something. You are set apart from sin, you are set apart to holiness. You are set apart from the old life, you are set apart to a new life. You're set apart from what you used to be, you're set apart to that which belongs to God. The particular words that are used here are in the optative mood, which means that this ought to be a desire or ought to be a wish. The divine objective that God has is to sanctify us wholly, and since that is the divine objective of our God, then that ought to be our objective as well. That this should be my desire. This is what God wants to do in my life. He wants me to be sanctified holy. Therefore, I should desire to be sanctified holy. So there's a divine objective here. Now, what do we see in this objective? This matter of a sanctification. For one thing, it sets before us the truth and it introduces a claim on our life. When you talk about being set apart to God, it is introducing a claim on your life. Or to put it another way, to be sanctified, you are understanding that what God wants for your life overrules any other thing in your life. That he wants you set apart from and set apart exclusively to him. Therefore, when you speak about sanctification, there is his claim that you are mine. And because you are mine, I have every right over your life. Have we not been bought with a price? Did he not purchase us through his redemptive work on the cross and redeemed us through his shed blood and purchased our salvation and he bought us through his redemptive work? He has every right to expect anything of me that he so expects. So when we see this divine objective is that God wants us to be holy, sanctified, we understand that is his claim on us that we belong to him. We are his. It's a claim of lordship. As he obeyed the Father's will, like in Hebrews 10, it spoke about then, said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. And he take away the first that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of the Lord Jesus. As our Lord obeyed the Father's will, our desire ought to be to obey the Father's will. So when we talk about sanctification, we start with this premise here. There is a claim on our life. God has redeemed us, and because he has redeemed us, he says, you are mine. You are my child. You are my property. You belong to me. So there is this claim on our life. It not only introduces, <coughs> it introduces a claim on our life, but it involves a conformity of our life. It's much more, sanctification is much more than you don't do certain things. I grew up in the mountains of North Carolina, and there's some of those fellas up there that was more wrong than there ever was right. I grew up in the atmosphere 
We don't smoke, we don't chew, we don't date girls who do. I mean, it was everything about what was wrong. But you understand, it's not, sanctification is about more than what is right and wrong. Sanctification, I belong to God, and this divine objective is to conform me to the image of His Son. Sanctification is that progressive work in my life where He's working to make me more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Did He not say in Romans 8, 29, for whom He did foreknow, He did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. Colossians 4, He talked about how He travailed in birth again until Christ was formed in them. Sanctification, this setting apart from, setting apart to God, is that work whereby He is conforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. A preacher that had great influence on me in my early years was a pastor from down in the Hickory area by the name of Charles Worley. Brother Charles is with the Lord now. He went home to be with the Lord a couple of years ago. Uh, Charles had had a big influence on my life. When the Lord created Charles Worley, he threw the mold away. There was no, nobody like him. I would go and ride with him to meetings and different things, and he just had a way of saying things and putting things that was unique to, to anybody that I was ever around. He grew up in the mountains there. He was mountain from the sole of his foot to the top of his head. And when he preached, I mean, he found pleasure in cutting heads off and making people bleed. He was hard sometimes, but he had a heart for people, and people knew that. But it was the way he put things. For example, I remember one night, this lady, while I was standing down there beside him in an altar, and a lady walked up to him, and she's just weeping. She said, Brother Worley, and she, you, you, he preached that night on God-loving people, and she said to him, do you really mean that God would love somebody like me? And she started telling him how she'd live. She said, do you really mean that God would love somebody like me? I'll never forget his answer. This would not come out of a uh, seminary. This was not how they would teach you to uh, counsel people. Brother Charles looked at her and said, does a hundred pound of flour make a big biscuit? That's the way he did it. And you, that got the point across anyway, amen. But I'll never forget one night, we were riding back from a meeting. I mean, we'd talked for a long time, but we'd kind of got quiet, and things was kind of quiet in, in the car. We'd rode several miles, and all of a sudden, Brother Worley, he said, Brother Ken, let me ask you something. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, now you be honest with me. And I said, I will. He said, uh, have you ever seen anything in my life that would not be like Christ? And I could see in the darkness in the car and the light that his eyes were filled with tears. And he said, is there anything about my life? Have you seen anything? Have you sensed anything in my life that you don't think that God would be pleased with? And I've lived that moment over and over again. And and I think about what Paul is talking about here. It's all about (coughs) our lives being conformed where we are like Christ. Is there anything in your life that would be unlike our Lord? Peter talked about he is our example. And the word example that he used there come from the word that described how a teacher would, a master would teach a student how to write in those days. Didn't have ballpoint pens or ink pens like we do. But they have little instruments that would be like a ballpoint end that had no ink, a little round tip. And paper was quite different than paper today. Vellum, sometimes it was skin or a thicker paper. But a master, a teacher would take that instrument and would make impressions and put and write down on that paper, not actually write, but would leave an impression on that paper. 
And the student would follow that impression to learn how to write. And you could say tonight that conformity is that I am to dot my I's and cross my T's just like my Lord. That I am to be like him in all things, to be conformed to his image. That's God's divine objective. But there's also a divine operation. Because I want you to understand tonight that the very thing God is asking of me, he is the very one that performs it in me. For you notice there, and the very God of peace sanctify you. You see, sanctification is a work of God. It is God enabling us. That statement there, the very God, could literally be translated God himself. And what Paul is saying is that God himself, the very God, sanctify you. He's telling me that this is a work that God does in my life. This is not a work he delegates. It's not a work that he delegates, delegates to his angelic messengers or anything else. It's a work that he does in my life. What kind of work does he do? Well, first of all, he speaks of how he does a saving work in our life. He is the God of what? Peace. And when he uses that particular word, he's not speaking of tranquility as we would think of as peace, but rather of the redemptive work that has brought us back into a relationship with God. The middle wall has been torn down. The enmity is gone. And we're no longer at war with God. We have been brought together. We are at peace with God through the finished work of Christ. He's describing the saving work of Christ. And hallelujah for his saving work. As I said a moment ago, 52 years ago yesterday, an Easter Sunday morning in the mountains of North Carolina, I did not grow up in church but again, everybody in the South goes to church on Easter. I went that day, and oh, blessed day it was when the Spirit of God brought me to understand I was lost and I needed to be saved. And that's where it began, the Holy Ghost bringing us to see ourselves as we are, a sinner that will go to hell without his saving merits. And that Sunday morning, I saw myself lost without Christ. I went to the altar, and hallelujah, he saved me that day. He brought me back. There is peace, the saving work of God. Hallelujah. That's enough to make a Presbyterian jump up, amen? Now, he's a saving work. Of God. Only God can save you. I can't save the Indians on Pine Ridge, but I can tell them about somebody who can, and I can introduce them to the one that can. I can't even get them to come to the altar. I, I don't, it's not a matter of playing games and being skillful and tactful and getting people and manipulating people to come. No, all you get out of that is empty professions. But if a man ever truly comes to God, God will do that saving work in his life. And that's the God of peace. It's a saving work. But he describes also his sanctifying work. God himself, the very God of peace, sanctify you and sanctify you wholly, entirely, completely, literally, through and through. There's the work that God does, working in us, bringing us till we become more like Christ bringing us, and we'll keep working until the day he takes us home to conform us and to make us the people that God wants us to be. There's a divine objective. There's a divine operation. God is doing it. But here's the third and point that I want to drive home, and I will not say, say, be long on it. There is also in this text a divine order. He speaks about the trichotomy of a believer. Spirit, soul, and body. 
It's like we're made up of three rooms. We are a three-room house. Our body, this is what you see, my body. Your body is what I see. That's our flesh. That's the old man that we're still hanging on to us. The body, our flesh, that's where our lusts are located. That's where our natural tendency is to go from God, not come to God. The body. The soul really dealing with our will and our desires and our emotions and whatever. But the spirit is that which we relate to God with. The body we relate to this old sinful world we live in. The spirit we relate to the God who has redeemed us from this present world. Now when you look at this matter, this order that is given here, I am mindful of an improper order. I believe that every word in this book is the word of God. When I open this Bible, (coughs) I'm not struggling to whether or not I have God's word. In fact, I will be concluding the book of Mark. I've been preaching through Mark for three and a half years I come to chapter 16, and it really shocked me how many commentaries ended with Mark 16, 8. And how the rest of them began saying that this was not Mark's writing, that this was added later, uh, that this was given to help explain the abrupt ending of Mark's writing and whatever. And I was amazed when I started pulling commentaries down or opening up on my computer, how many commentaries started with ver- stopped at verse 8 and no other word was said about verse 9. Now, you can come up with all the arguments if you are the theologian here, but I find it in my Bible, and it is in my Bible because God wanted to be in my Bible. I believe that. That's how I feel about the Bible. I believe that every word that God puts in the Bible, He used that word for a reason. I don't believe there's a word there that shouldn't be there. I don't believe there's a sentence that should not be there. I believe even how things are said or even the order in which they are said are divinely inspired of God. I say that because... Most of the time, if I walked around this room or walked up to you and I said, you know, the Bible talks about how we are made up of three parts. Do you know what those three parts are? Nine out of ten times, this is the answer I'm going to get. Body, soul, spirit. I was speaking in a uh, Bible school one night and I was speaking on this particular text and I mentioned, and there was a professor there. Uh, don't, don't tell him. I won't tell you his name, so that way you'll never be able to tell him. But he was a little arrogant, if you know what I mean. He is a professor. You know, that kind of stuff. And uh, so I looked at him, and I said, you know, the Bible speaks about a trichotomy uh, that were made up of three parts. What are they? And he said, body, soul, spirit. And I said to him, you're right about the parts, but your order is all wrong. You notice in the scripture here that it is not body, soul, spirit. That is an improper order. The proper order is spirit, soul, body. Now you say, what is the significance of that? It is everything. Can I give you an example? It's Sunday morning. You've worked all week, especially been a long week. And you had to work overtime on Saturday, so you didn't get a day off. The alarm clock goes, on, goes off on Sunday morning. And the body says, oh boy, is it time to get up? The flesh says, stay in bed. After all, you never miss. They won't miss you today. The old flesh says, just sleep in today. You you need the rest anyway. And so the flesh says, just stay there under that warm blanket and that pillow that is so loving you. And the flesh, the body says, don't get out of bed. Don't go to church. 
An improper order would be the body would dictate what I do. That's the improper order. The proper order is not what my body tells me to do, but what my spirit tells me to do. The spirit is to be the Lord of my life. It is the dominant one in my life. It tells me what to do. If I live by body, then I will lay in bed. But if I live by spirit, I don't care how I feel. I'm going to get up and do what God wants me to do because that is his will. Same thing, you ever had anybody mistreat you? I know, I know that folks don't fight in Houston, Texas. Nobody ever gets upset. Nobody ever talks about anybody in Houston. Nobody ever mistreats you. But say, for example, somebody did you wrong. Now, one of two things is going to happen. It all depends on what the order is in your life. Spirit, soul, body, or body, soul, spirit. If it's body, the first thing you're going to say, boy, when I get a hold of him, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. I am going to whip him all over the street. Of course, I'm going to do it in love. But I am going to let him know what I think. That's the body. The flesh hangs on to old feelings. The flesh becomes bitter. The flesh wants revenge. The flesh seeks to get even with someone else. That's what the body does. And if the body is ruling in your life, what somebody did to you can dominate you and destroy you and allow you to become better. But on the other hand, if you've got the proper order and the spirit is the one calling the shots in your life, you're going to forgive you're going to let it go. You're just going to walk away from it. You're not going to try to hurt them. No, you're going to put them in the hands of God and let him do what needs to be done. Same thing about God's call. Maybe this week somebody will, God will speak to somebody's heart and say, I want you to go into medical missions. I want you to go to Canada. I want you to go here. I want you to go serve on a reservation. And God says, I want you to go. The body will say, I don't know how you could go. What, do you, what, what makes you, how, how would you live if you gave up your job? The body will tell you all kinds of things. How do you think you'll make it? You can't just drag your family uh, 500 miles away or 1,000 or 3,000 miles away. You, the body will tell you everything. And if you live by the flesh, then the flesh is going to be the victor in your life. But if the Spirit is the one calling the shots in your life, the issue is not how you will make it. The issue is He has called me. The issue is not how will I live. The issue is that this is the will of God for your life. This Sunday you'll be taking faith promise. And finally understand faith promise. Faith promise is more than calculating what you are able to do. It's more than you getting out your spiritual calculator and say, we got this much coming in. Da, 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 da. And I believe we can... We did this last year, but I believe we can increase it just a little bit. I believe we'll be able to get by. In fact, we'll have the truck paid off this year. I believe we'll be able to do it. So you figure out what you can do. That's not faith promise. If I understand faith promise and grace given as the scripture teaches us, it's what God wants to give through you, and then you allow God to give that through you over the course of the coming year. That is really what faith promise is all about. But it'll come along Sunday morning and the cards are going to be passed out. And you are going to do one of two things. You're going to calculate what you can give or you are going to listen to what you should give. It all depends on what order things are in your life. If you are living body, soul, and spirit, 
then you are going to give what you think you can give and what you think you can do. But if you're living spirit, soul, and body, you're going to be listening to the God in heaven. And you may say to yourself, I don't know how I can do it, but God, if that's what you want me to give, then that's what I will say I'm going to give this year. And watch God supply that for you over the coming year. You see, there's a divine order in this thing. God's objective is to sanctify me, to set me apart unto him, and to conform me to the image of his son. And that process will be thwarted if I do not allow him to do what he wants to do. If I am living body, soul, and spirit, then the flesh is going to control my emotions, my will, and my desires, and the spirit will not be fulfilled. But if I live spirit, soul, body, the order that is given in the scripture that I will do what God wants me to do, I do not care what my body or my flesh says. I learned this a long time ago. The body is a wonderful servant, but it is a horrible master. If I let my flesh rule and reign in my life, it will take me from God every time. But if I am yielded to him and I am living spirit, soul, and body, it doesn't matter what my flesh is tempted with. It doesn't matter what my flesh is saying. I am going to do that which he wants me to do, and I'm going to please him in all things. So when it comes to what God wants to do in our lives, we allow him to do it. But when we allow him, he does it. And he sanctifies us, spirit, soul, and body. Who is king in your life tonight? What rules and reigns in your life tonight? He's still working on me. I wish I could get up here and say tonight, I, I'm just like Jesus all the time. I wish I could. I fail my Lord every day. And I am ashamed that I let him down as much as I do. But I can say he's still working on me to sanctify me wholly. So I, my challenge to you in the first night of this missions conference, let this conference be a spirit, soul, body conference. Not a body, soul, spirit. And if it becomes spirit, soul, and body, then God will do something in our hearts this week as we listen to him and we obey him. Let's stand to our feet, please. Your pastor is going to come and we'll let him conclude the service however he so desires. But the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Spirit, soul, and body that you be blameless at the coming of our Lord. Our Father tonight, in Jesus' name, let the word speak to my heart. Lord, I have shared your word, but I want to listen to the very things that I've spoken of. You work in my heart. Move in all of our lives. Speak to us. May this be a blessed week. I know they've had conferences over the years, weeks that have been unusually blessed of God. But in this week, Lord, all we ask is that you do something in us and we'll praise you for it. Bless now these closing moments in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor, you come. Christ does not just want to be resident of your heart. He wants to be president of your heart. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Ken, we'll just let Miss Eva play for just a moment, and we'll sing a verse momentarily. These altars are open. Why don't you come? Why don't you come right now? Come on. Some are praying, why don't you join them? Why don't you join them?